Ecclesiastes. I'm going to be reading in Ecclesiastes. I'm going to be reading in Proverbs. <coughs> For some of you with short-term memory, them books are real close together. <laughs> Ecclesiastes. <laughs> Ecclesiastes. Don't you just hate it when them preachers read in Genesis and then once you turn all the way <laughs> to, to the book of 1 John or something? <laughs> They're all over the place. I ain't going to get that deep. I can't cover that much ground. Amen. We're just going to be right next door to each other here. Amen. Ecclesiastes, ninth chapter, amen. While you're turning, man, I'm sure glad Brother Noah made it out this week. And I've been praying for him. He's my buddy, amen. I told him, I said, <coughs> I thought it was all over with. We've been tag teaming this thing for about six or seven years now. And, uh, of course, I, you know, I've got to say something. I told him already, so don't go running and telling him like I'm trying to get something on him when he ain't in the room. Because I, I don't care to look people in the eye and just bust them, man. I said, and you're the only guy I know. I fall off a cliff and preach at a camp meeting three weeks later. Amen. <laughs> that tears me up. And preach like he preached last night. <laughs> I told him, I said, if you see me on top of the church like I'm fixing to jump, leave me alone. I'm trying to get closer to God. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Let me fall. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Maybe the Lord will help me like that. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, if you want to put a net under there, go ahead. I won't be mad. <laughs> I guess when you got it, you got it, huh? Amen. Ecclesiastes, the ninth chapter. I want to start reading verse number 14. I've always been intrigued by these couple scriptures here. I've never really ever stopped to really look at them and try to study them out. <clears throat> but I felt like the Lord just dealt with me here, amen, to preach from them. Fourteenth chapter of the book of uh, Ecclesiastes, or ninth chapter, rather, verse 14. The Bible says, There was a little city and few men within it. And there came a great king against it and besieged it and built great bulwarks against it. Now, there was found in, in it a poor wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city. Yet no man remembered the same poor man. Then said I, Wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are not heard. The words of the wise men are heard in quiet more than the cry of him that ruleth among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroyeth much good. Amen. Hold that thought and turn back to the book of Proverbs, the 7th chapter. I'm going to read some very familiar scriptures here <coughs> to covet your prayers. Proverbs, the 7th chapter. I want to read verse, I want to split this up a little bit. I'm going to start in verse number 6. Read a few verses there. <coughs> The Bible says, For at the window of my house I looked through my casement and beheld among the simple ones I discerned among the youths a young man void of understanding passing through the streets near her corner and he went the way to her house. I'm going to skip on down to verse number 22 and finish the chapter out, just a few verses. This is concerning this same young man void of understanding he goeth after her straightway as an ox goeth to, his, to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of the stocks till a dart strike through his liver as a bird hasteneth to the snare and knoweth not that it is for his life. Hearken unto me now therefore, O ye children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths. For she hath cast down many wounded Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell going down to the chambers of death. Amen. <clears throat> I just threw a lot down here, I realize. Amen. I want the Lord to help me this morning. I feel like He's going to. I don't know if we'll just pray together. But if the Lord help me, I just got just a little thought that I'd like to share with you today. I'd like to preach on, if I'd known then 
what I know now. Amen. If I'd known then what I know now. Uh, This young man is described by the writer as foolish, has thrown himself in the way of temptation. Uh, This woman met him, a harlot the Bible describes her as, and he described her by her attire, by her subtlety, by her voice, by her uh, pretensions. She made arguments and she prevailed upon this young man. Amen. She began to talk to him about love and about Uh, how that they could be satisfied in this love. Of course, we all know uh, the story without having to go too deep into it. Basically, this is a young man that's being drawn away by a married woman, amen, a wicked woman. And the writer is viewing all of this that's taken place from his window. He's looking out down at the street, and he sees all this. As I begin to think about this, I begin to think about the author, about Solomon, And how this scene is so well telling uh, this story because Solomon is drawing from his own experience that he knows about personally concerning a young man that was ensnared and ruined by lewd women. Amen. The the, the story of Solomon is somewhat of a tragedy. Amen. When we begin to see the uh, Solomon, the King Solomon coming on to the Bible pages, we read a story of a man that everybody, if I ask you, what was Solomon most noted for? Wisdom. Amen. Solomon was the most wisest man, we say. We all know the story about how that Solomon, when he became king, uh, he made a petition to the Lord. Him and the Lord had a conversation. And the Lord more or less said, Solomon, what would you that I do for you? to help you in this kingdom that you've taken from your father. What, what do you need? And instead of great riches, instead of preeminence over all of his enemies, instead of longevity of life, and instead of position and power upon this earth, Solomon's plea was, Lord, give me the wisdom and knowledge and understanding that I can justly rule your people. Help me to make decisions based upon wisdom. Amen. Help me find your mind. And we've seen that played over the Bible pages many times as many people would come before Solomon with problems. How that Solomon would just rightly divide him with such a way about him that you just couldn't imagine. You remember the two women that brought the the son before him, the child. And then one of them had lost their son. And there was only one left. And both mothers claimed that child. Amen. To be theirs. And we see how the wisdom that we really couldn't fathom or understand. Amen. Begin to come forth as he told him to divide the child. Amen. And let one half part and let the other half part. But it was the real true mama that said, let no harm come to this child. But in other words, let her have it. I mean, that took wisdom. I mean, that took understanding. I mean, uh, if that had been some of us, uh, we'd have set up a jury. We'd have tried to investigate the matter. But God gave him enough wisdom to know that a real mama's going to be enough to love, even if it means giving the son up. So there's no harm to it. Amen. Solomon was noted for his wisdom. He was so noted that the Bible tells us how that the queen of the east, queen of Sheba, how she traveled so far just to come and see Solomon in all his glory. Huh? The Lord even noted him as being one of the wisest men and told of all his glory and all of his smarts, if you will. But here, we see a different Solomon. We see a man that's noted for wisdom. Yeah, he made some foolish decisions in his life. And now he's standing at a window, and he's looking out, and he sees a young man facing the same crossroads that he faced years ago.
No doubt today Solomon probably wishes his end was as good as his start. But we all know Solomon's downfall. The Bible says he had many strange wives. He didn't just see one woman. He followed after another, then after another, then after another. And that wasn't bad enough, but every woman had a different God. And Solomon followed after this God, then another God, and then another God. And so we, here we see a picture of a man that started out with heavenly wisdom. Are you hearing me? Not earthly wisdom. He didn't get it out of a book. He sought God for it, and God imputed to him wisdom. But now, this man that's noted for his wisdom is beginning to make foolish decisions. I could just imagine Solomon. I know I'm slowing down a bit here, but we'll catch up here in a minute. I could just imagine Solomon looking out that window and saying, man, if I only knew all that wisdom I had, all that understanding, but I couldn't see the direction I was going. If I only knew then what I know right now, things would have been a whole lot different. Come on. When Solomon started out reigning as king, he didn't plan for his end to be that way. Huh? He didn't plan for it to be that way. It was in his heart to serve the Lord all his life and worship Him only. But we don't see that's not the ending of the story there. Amen. Amen. And Solomon's looking out a window, and all these emotions are rushing back in. Maybe he goes back to the first time when he met that first heathen woman that led him away worshiping idols. Then maybe his mind went back to another time when he made another bad decision. Then another bad decision. I can see the man of God looking out his window, staring down at that young man. And within his heart, he's saying, don't go that way. Don't go that way. Don't follow after her. If you only knew where you was heading, if you only knew what was fixing to get a hold of you, you're just looking at the pretense of the now. If you could see tomorrow, if you could see next week, if you could see down through time and see that she's leading you down to hell, her house is the way to death. Oh, you simple man, you young boy, listen to me. If you only knew what's going to happen. The most pitiful thing in this world is a person that's made a wreck out of their life. And they know deep down in their hearts they knew better than to end up where they're at. Oh, God. Huh? My mind's just going real fast thinking about some of the preachers. Amen. That knew better. Amen. Come on here now. And now all they can do is just stare out a window and say, if I only realized, if I only knew back then... At that most critical moment, what it was going to be now, amen, I would have fled flee from the situation. I would have ran from it. Are you hearing me? But the devil's got such a way. He comes to us so subtly. Did you see? Did you see how the writer was very describing this young woman? He just didn't say there was a young man and there was a young woman. He didn't do that. He got descriptive. Solomon seeing himself. No doubt there's characteristics of that woman that match some of the characteristics of one of his many wives. Maybe it took him back to the night, to the time when he first got that glance of ungodliness. Come on in here. I know this is getting a little deep here, here. Amen. I'm trying to break it down here. Help me out. Amen. Solomon's looking. He's writing. There ain't nothing like writing an experience from first-hand account. Are you hearing me? Solomon knows what he's writing in this story. Solomon's looking down. He's broken. He's torn. He's saying, if you only knew. Look at her. She's all painted up. 
look at her. She's all perfumed up. Oh, God. No doubt she has blankets and tapestries. He knows exactly what's getting ready to happen. He knows exactly what's getting ready to take place. Because he was in that room. He walked down that street. He hung out on that corner. He leaned up against that light post. Are you hearing me? I tell you why some of you, I feel the Holy Ghost here. I tell you why some of you struggling like you're struggling. You're hanging out in neighborhoods you don't need to be hanging out in. You're standing on street corners you don't need to be standing in. You're playing around with things you don't need to be playing around about. If you only knew. If you only knew. be a taboo to go to the red light district. Some of the older ones know what I'm talking about. That part of town. That seedy part of town that you stay away from after dark. We got some of them up home. It just ain't good wisdom to go down them roads after dark. Don't ever go to the devil looking for a fight. I've heard people get up in a moment of joy and stupidity at the same time. I'm going after the devil. I'm going to go in his backyard and see who wins. Go on down to his house. He'll begin to pipe. Huh? He'll just start piping. He'll get out the photo book and just start showing you pictures. Oh, my God. Oh, God. You need to stay away from that dark road. Huh? You need to stay away from that path. Come on here now. That's why we preach against some of the things we preach against. That swear box ain't going to send you to hell. That box is not going to send you to hell. but we visit places in that box that we wouldn't dare go in public. We don't believe in homosexuality. We don't believe in lesbianism. We don't believe in any form of lustful, ungodly stuff, but we can watch it. People are looking at me and say, well, I can control it, brother. I just, you know, you know what? We're fools. And that's what the whole pretense of this message is about. Being foolish. You're foolish if you think you can handle the flesh. I'm not being disrespectful here. You are foolish if you think you can lay in Delilah's lap and her not bind you. Oh, but I broke the cord. Lay down again, Samson. What's so tragic about Samson is he gave Delilah the weapons to bind his soul. He played the game. He rolled the dice. He gave information out. He told her what to do to destroy him. She kept on toying with him. She kept on playing with him. And finally the Bible says he told her all of his heart. No wonder our Bible says, guard your hearts. For out of it flows the issues of life. Devil's after your soul. He's after your heart. Oh, the men and women, if they only knew what they know now. Oh, God. Tie me up with them new coins. It's never been occupied. Didn't he play the game? Solomon was following her down the street, laying in her lap. Holy Ghost would move on and try to deliver him out. He'd run right back to her house. Oh, I believe the most miserable time of Samson's life wasn't when he was getting his eyes put out. It wasn't when they deceived him about his riddle. But it was what he learned when he was grinding at the mill. That was the most 
hardest time the man of God ever had. Every time he went around in that circle, he said, if I only knew what I know now. Oh, God, my hair's gone. Every vow ever made to God's been broken. My eyes are put out. I don't have no direction. I can't see. I'm just grinding like a dog, like a prisoner. I believe Samson cried out a midnight. Oh, if I only knew what I know now. If I only realized where Delilah was taking me. Daddy used to tell me when I was growing up, too late to cry over spilt milk when it's already on the floor. You can't have it now. Well, they did a little, they did a little skit here one time. They all had toothpaste. They squirt that toothpaste out, and then they had to try to get it back into the tube once it was squirted out. Y'all remember that a few years ago? Talking about when words leave your mouth, how you can't take things back. There has been some times when I've said some things and I've asked somebody to forgive me because of God's mercy, they forgave me. But there's been things I've done in my life that has left such an impression that even when I ask God to forgive me, I can still remember it. God might not remember it, but I remember it. And I find myself saying, man, that was such a dumb move. Man, that was such a foolish decision. Why in the world did I go that way? Why in the world did I even go that direction? You ever been there, moms? You ever been there, dads? Huh? You ever look at your boy and said, I wish if I knew back then uh, what I know now, uh, I'd make things a whole lot different. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? I believe we've got a lot of mom and dads in here that wouldn't go to some of the places they went to if they knew what it was going to do to them today. We got any Solomons in the house this morning? That when you look back over your life, uh, instead of being happy, instead of being satisfied, all you see is the wrong decisions. All you see is the bad turns. Oh, I wish I wouldn't have did it. Oh, I wish I wouldn't have said it. Oh, I wish I wouldn't have. I feel God here. I tell you what, you better get wisdom and follow the voice and spirit of God. Solomon's looking out that window, Brother Noah. He's saying, son, don't go there. Don't go. Don't. Don't go there. No. Dealing with my children and dealing with young people, I'll find myself saying, listen to me, son. I've been there. I know what it's like to be 17. I know what it's like to be 15. Moms and dads and pastors and youth leaders don't know nothing. They're holding me back. They're just holding me back. 17 years old. I packed up my bags and told my dad, per se, it's time for me to be my own man. I left the house. Just the other day, I found myself in a time of prayer saying, man, I wish I was back with my legs under Daddy's table. Oh, God. I wish I still had that old bedroom. Huh? Lord's blessed me and help me. There's been times I wish I was still flipping hamburgers at McDonald's. Huh? Come on in here now. Let's not act like we ain't never made no wrong decisions in this life. And I find me telling them young men, listen, listen, I've been there. I thought that.
exact same thing. I felt that exact same way. I looked my 17-year-old in the eye all the time. I said, Daddy, listen, Daddy. Daddy ain't trying to hurt you. Daddy's trying to help you. I want you to make right decisions in areas I made wrong decisions. serving God. And I'm trying to tell you young men and you young girls don't go that way. I felt like the Lord told me just to come to the window today and look out. Don't go that way. Don't follow after. If you only knew what it was going to bring you if you only knew where it was going to take you. Wisdom. Wisdom. I ain't never preached on wisdom. I never thought I'd be preaching on it like this. Wisdom. Listen to me. Wisdom is not having the correct answer to the problem. Wisdom is not figuring out the situation. Wisdom is realizing I can make a bad decision. Wisdom is realizing I can fall. Wisdom is realizing I can mess it up. <laughs> That's wisdom. We've got a generation. There's an attitude on the horizon. It don't matter. Huh? It don't matter. I've always been a preacher and a person that I always try to let people understand. And I know there's got to be a degree of separation. But I don't never, ever, Brother Noah, want to get to the place to where I look at myself as some kind of something that's untouchable. And if I ever condescend upon a congregation because they are touchable, them a great injustice because wisdom is realizing brother Kimball that I might be doing it right right now but one foolish choice can send me down a bad road oh God I might be able to preach the stars down I might be able to sing to the glory rolls but all it takes is one foolish decision and you can kill every bit of it. Are you hearing me? I feel the Holy Ghost in this place today. I said all it takes is one bad choice. All it takes is one late night. All it takes is one time in a chat room talking about what you shouldn't be talking about. Oh, maybe you have been able to control that one-eyed devil, but all it takes is one program with just a little bit of leading. Because a little leaving, leaving the whole love. Are you hearing me? You are a fool if you think you can take fire in your bosom and not get burnt. The Bible is not kind to fools. A prudent man does things without thinking, makes decisions without thinking about the consequences. A fool opens his mouth wide before he knows the facts. Solomon said, hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Why did you write that, Solomon? Because there was a time when I acted like a fool and I just opened my mouth. Oh my God. <laughs> if I only knew then what I know now. I think a lot of backsliders just left that. I believe we could really talk to them today. They tell them that happiness that's promised is a facade. The smile that's given is empty. The 
the joy of drinking. The pleasure only lasts for a season. But what do you do with the rest of the time when the season's over? A season here in this earth here only lasts, what, just a few minutes? What do we do the rest of the time? When it's summer out, we all enjoy the sunshine. Spring brings forth new life. Fall closes it out. But it's that winter that kills me. <laughs> the cold, the bitterness, the death, the emptiness. You left the house of God in your summer. But summer has passed. The harvest has ended. And we are not saved. <laughs> if I only knew where this road was going to take me. We read also in your hearing about a little city. I've done some study on this. Some commentators say that this represents the church, the small city, and the great king that besieged it represents the enemy or is our soul. But the fact of the matter was that there was a small city with few men there. And that great king came against them, besieged them, and built bulwarks all around them. But there was a poor, wise man in the midst of that city. And because of his wisdom, the city was saved. That's the end of the story. No one remembered that poor, wise man's name or his wisdom. It sort of leaves us on a cliffhanger right there. And just me, what I'd like to think, and the way I look at it, is that they found themselves besieged again. But this time, they didn't miss him, the poor wise man. How many times has your pastor prayed you through? How many times has the preacher stood up outnumbered and flat-footed and preached you the truth anyway? And you was delivered. But there came a time when you chose to no longer remember that wisdom. We're living in the generation of that right now. There's some of you, you're not touched by the Spirit of God today like you was this time last year. There's some of you that the cords of your iniquity has wrapped around you a little bit tighter than they did last month. Oh, some of you boys just <clears throat> don't have the goals in your life that you used to have. Brother Noah started to go that way, and then maybe he was, he was going to mention it, but his mind got taken in another direction. Talking about our young men it's not about uh, not talking about evangelizing and stuff like they used to. Or, you know, we used to say that's our next evangelist or that's our next or that's our next Sunday school teacher candidate. That's my next doctor. That's my next engineer. That's a very bad area to get right in the middle of right there. I want my boys to, and my girl and my daughter to be just as success, successful as the next person. But I've always told my boys, son, I don't care if you don't go to college. I don't care if you do. Well, I do care, but amen. I mean, old dad's just got a GED. And I don't mean that I was real smart. Amen. Some person told me GED stands for get even dumber. I don't know. <laughs> but 
I told my boy, I don't care if you dig ditches the rest of your life for ten bucks an hour. Don't forget God. Amen. We judge success by by access, excessiveness, what we accumulate, and what we have. That rich man took a stroll along the property line that evening and said, I have been rich and increased with much goods, and I am going to tear down my barn. I feel the Holy Ghost right here. And I'm going to build greater ones. But the Bible says, Thou fool! He did not recognize God. He did not see God's hand upon his life at all. But it was I, 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 me, me, me. Does that not describe the church age and the generation we're living in right now? I'm going to do something. I'm going to be something. It's me. It's what I want. It's what I'm going to choose. It's what I'm going to decide. And when you have an attitude like that, the Bible says you are being foolish. Are you hearing me? He said, thou fool, thy soul is required a day this night. I could just imagine him standing before God. Them barns didn't look that good all of a sudden. Them riches didn't mean anything. I told my boy, oh, I tell my children repeatedly, don't get nothing else in this life when you get a hold of God. I told my little girl, you don't worry about no college. You don't worry about going to do nothing like that. You can live in my house till you're 40 years old if you want. I'll feed you. I'll clothe you. I'll help you. I mean, just don't make bad choices. <laughs> I'd rather her stay in my house till she's an old maid than to bring three kids a playpen and a stroller and a wrecked marriage and a wreck. Wow, oh, help me. I said we better be careful about the road we're taking. Oh, God. Oh, God. I love her. God forbid that that would happen. I'd try my best to help. But I knew at night, I know for a fact at night, though, when she's tossing in that bed, her mind's going to be saying, if I only knew, if I only listened, if I only took heed, if I just didn't go that way. Oh, I like what Brother Noah said last night. The only reason why you go the way you go is because when God was dealing with you not to go there, you overrode his knowledge. Nobody falls out of grace and into sin to what that God didn't try to deal with them. You made a statement, brother. We was talking a while back. You said, you told me, you said, it's amazing how God will deal with a man before he goes out. He tries to pull all the brakes. He tries to push all the stops. He tries to build all the barricades. Don't go that way. Don't go that way. But it's a fool that says within his heart, there is no God. You know what that's saying? It don't matter what he says. I'm, uh, I'm going to do what I want to do. Huh? I'll bear the punishment. I'll bear the consequences. You say that now. But wait till you're grinding. Right. How like this brother preached last night. Wait till you're in Eli's shoes. And your family's wrecked and tore up because of your decisions. Right. If I only knew then, 
what I know right now. It'd be nice to go back to 15 years old. Just start another run at it. And as I passed by that point of exchange, I could look that temptation in the eye and say, not this time. <laughs> Keep on running. <laughs> oh, God. I could go to that same intersection and say, not this time. I'm going to keep on running. Wouldn't it be nice if we could do it all over again? (laughs) But we can't. But we can't. So we're to face with that defining moment when we're weighed in the balance and we can either go to the left or we can go to the right. That decision right there at that moment is what's going to determine if you have peace in God in your elder years or if you're going to live a life full of regret. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of Christians in the house of God that's got faces long as mules because they know they're not really living where they should be in God because of choices they made. And don't you think for one moment it doesn't break God's heart He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if you only knew, if you only knew the peace that's yours, if you only knew, I tried how I would have loved to gather you like a hand of their brood. I sent the prophets, you wouldn't listen. I sent the messengers, and you slayed them. If you only knew. I had for you and you would not Obey the Lord right here, church. As they come and get us a song quickly, I want us all to stand across this building.
it's a warning. I said, it's a warning today. Don't go there. Don't walk that way. I can could, I could just imagine the Lord today at the windows of glory going, don't go that way. Don't go that way. It don't have to be that end. Are you hearing me, young people? You don't have to be a tragedy. You don't have to live a life of regrets today. We can make good decisions. We can walk up right before the Lord all the days of our lives. Understand me, young people. That don't mean that we're not going to make mistakes. There's a difference between making a mistake and just deliberately turning and walking in another direction. Hear me. The Lord's not dealing with just mistakes and, and problems and issues that we have. There is someone here, more than one under the sound of my voice, that you're standing on street corners you need to get out of. And you're heading down paths you need to stay away from. You say you want to love God with one side of your mouth, but yet you're trying to cling to the world with the other. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. You keep it up, you ain't going to have to worry about turning loose of the Holy Ghost in God because He's going to turn loose of you. <laughs> I said, He'll turn loose of you. Go on. That's how it's going to be. Go on. Turn to your own pernicious ways. Go ahead. Go after it. Go after it. It'll begin to play something. Every saint of God praying in this house. I know this is a little sober on the first day here. I'm sorry. I know I'm not sorry. That's what I come here to do this week is preach. If it's not your flavor of message, I don't know what to tell you today. But I do know that the Lord's here and He wants to help somebody. You've been staring at them crossroads, young person? Huh? Pastors tried to warn you. Mom and dad's tried to talk to you. Huh? God's trying to talk to you today. God's trying to talk to you today. God said, don't go that way. But if you allow Him to have control, He'll put your feet exactly where He wants you to step. The Bible says that a good man steps ordered of the Lord. I want to walk where He wants me to walk, don't you? I want to be where He wants me to be this morning. Would there be a one? Don't worry about your neighbor. Don't worry about your neighbor. Where are you at with God? Huh? You just going to sit there and both of you lose out with God? Don't worry about your neighbor. This is personal today. It's always been personal. What are you going to do with your salvation today? You going to throw it away for just a time? Are you going to give in to the pleadings of this world? Or are you going to choose not to walk down that path so you won't have to bear the scars and the memories of a bad decision? While they begin to sing and play, would there be one young person who's not ashamed and will step out and say, Brother Jerry, I come with intentions to get a hold of God this week. I want to make it. I need help. I need strength. I don't want to fall. I don't want to falter. I don't want to be another statistic. I don't want to be another testimony in the youth camp of a tragic goings on in life. But I want to stand for God. Would there be one young man? Would there be one young white lady in this building that's going to stand out and say, it doesn't matter if this whole pew sits here, I'm going to go up front and get what I need because I'm going to answer to God for my life and nobody else. I'm not ashamed to say this, but there should be a lot more than this coming out of these pews. It's your life, friend. It's your choice. I can't make it for you. I can't make you do it. I'm just trying to lead you in the right direction.
That's right. Come on in. Come on in. Come on in. Come on in and get a hold of God this morning. All you counselors and moms and dads that will, let's gather in behind these young people and let's help them pray this morning. Some of them is making ultimate decisions in their lives today. And we need to be praying for them.